Erev Tov, everyone. It is wonderful to see you. I love that it always takes me a long time to get you all in your seats because you are so happy to see each other. And I might invite people to come in a little bit into the center if they'd like. We know that we are not going to be at capacity today. And if someone is sitting in your seat, I, it is Kol Nidre, please be nice to them. We begin together on page 86. Like no other prayer, Kol Nidre compels our presence, and not just us alone, but the memorized outline too of younger years, the gentle feel of those who tucked us in, who blessed our days, consoled our nights, and came as we do on this eve with memories of their own. We tonight are memories in the making, warming seats for others who will remember us in some Kol Nidre they shall hear when we are gone. Present. Two among us are memories more recent of what we did or said or were or weren't since last year at this time, of what we learnt or lost, of kisses that we gave or got, the laugh that lovers recognize, the days of empty wandering and wondering where God was, or knowing with compelling certainty that God was with us even in despair. Kol Nidre harbors memory of all this. Its melody persists, insists, demands, and summons our acknowledgement of time, what we recall of others past, and what we vow to leave behind for others still to come, who will remember us. We kindle this memorial light for those we loved and those we lost. For all we miss from the year now gone, let us prepare for Kol Nidre, our song of memory.
tremendous gratitude to our very gifted central member, Julian Schwartz, for the gift of his music every year. We now are so pleased to bring in the light of this festival, and I'm so happy to have my family come up on the bima, Jacob, Gabriel, Eli, and Rose, to light the festival candles. We begin on page 87. Somehow it feels that all is right with the world, that we have you back here in the sanctuary, so many of you, that we have our Rabbi Emeritus with us on the Bema. Peter, it is so good to be with you, to have started with the glorious strains of that Bruch Kol Nidre with Julian, and wait until you hear our cantor. Um, we know that this service, this Kol Nidre, there is something so incredible about how this brings us back. All of you here, and I want to acknowledge all of you who are here, our members, our neighbors, and our live streamers from all around the world. It brings us back to our memory, back to our tradition, and I hope to our best selves. As we hear these ancient words and these ancient melodies, let us have them open up the gates and open up our hearts so we may do the work of this holiday. We continue with the call to worship on page 88. Please rise. We continue reading together at the bottom of the page. Blessed are you, eternal God, from whom the evening flows. We find you in the mysteries of time, the passage of seasons, the night sky and all its wonders. You roll light away from darkness and darkness from light, causing day to pass and twilight to fall. Baruch atah Adonai, hama'ariv aravim. Blessed are you, O God, from whom the evening flows. In just a moment, we'll recite Shema together, but uh, we have to note that on all other days of the Jewish calendar, we recite the second line of the Shema quietly to ourselves. Here on Yom Kippur, for this day alone, we recite this second line out loud in full voice in recognition of the ancient temple 
and in a time when the high priest would stand before the crowds who had gathered for the Yom Kippur ritual, and when that high priest would recite the name of God, to which the entire house of Israel would respond loudly, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed. So tonight we walk in the ways of our ancestors, uniting our voices and memories with generations past. And so we close our eyes and sing out these words that have bound Jews together and Jews with their God for millennia. Shema. Please be seated. On page 92, we continue together. You shall love your eternal God with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your being. Set these words which I command you this day upon your heart. Teach them faithfully to your children. Speak of them in your home and on your way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign upon your hand. Let them be a symbol before your eyes, and inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Be mindful of all my mitzvot and do them. So shall you consecrate yourselves to your God. I am your eternal God, who led you out of Egypt to be your God. I am your eternal God. Someone asked, why in our Jewish worship services do we continually remind ourselves of these moments in the life of our people. And Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel responded, we're a people in whom the past endures, in whom the present is inconceivable without moments gone by. The exodus lasted a moment, a moment enduring forever. What happened once upon a time happens all the time. And so as we rejoice in our freedom and prepare to sing Micha Mocha together, we learn to yearn for the freedom of all who are in chains. Page 93. Micha mocha baili madonai Micha mocha detar bakodesh Nora tehilot Malechotecha rau vanecha Bokei ayam lifnei Moshe umiriyam Zeli Ano peyamero Adonai <laughs> We ask God for, to watch over us, the people we love, with a sheltering presence of peace. Ah. 
face our nakedness, mirrored contemplations of concealed selves laid bare of artifice, backdrop to a cavernous silence broken only by the quiet chant of Kol Nidre. This is the time when consciousness colludes with conscience to shatter the delusions with which we cloak our souls. Tonight, God asks us where and what we are. We creatures fashioned in God's goodness are capable of cruelty. We vessels of God's holiness litter others' lives with profanities of speech and deed and will. The nakedness of Kal Nidre's call can pierce our metal, unsettling us with echoes of the chaos that we have created and caused, the brokenness of loved ones at whose lives we chipped away. Give us pause to recognize how every year we choose again to grow more worn and withered, dry inside, or stronger, older, far more resolute, awake to what should matter most. Which shall it be? Kol Nidre sounds especially pure to souls who have lost their way or find themselves enmeshed in webs of hopelessness. God, disentangle us, we pray. When, where we have sinned, remove the shame of self and make us worthy of Kol Nidre's melody. Please rise.
We continue on page 98 together. 
Adonai, our God, is merciful and gracious, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing mercy to thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and granting pardon. God, God of our mothers and fathers, grant that our prayers may reach you. Do not be deaf to our pleas, for we are not so arrogant and stiff-necked as to say before you, our God and God of all ages, we are perfect and have not sinned. Rather, do we confess, we have gone astray, we have sinned, we have transgressed. Oh, 
We jeer, we kill, we lie, we mock. We neglect, we oppress, we pervert, we quarrel. We rebel, we steal, we transgress, we are unkind. We are violent, we are wicked, we are extremists. We yearn to do evil, we are zealous for bad causes. For all of these sins, O God of mercy, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. Slachlano 
מחלנו, סלח לנו מחלנו, כפלנו. על החטא שחטאנו לפניך בנטיית קרוב for the sins we have committed against you through arrogance and selfishness. For the sins we have committed against you by defrauding others. For the sins we have committed against you through denial and deceit. ועל חטא שחטאנו לבניך במאכל ובמשתה. For the sins we have committed against you through greed and overindulgence. על חטא שחטאנו לבניך באימוץ הלב. For the sins we have committed against you through hardening our hearts. ועל חטא שחטאנו לבניך בחנופה. For the sins we have committed against you through hypocrisy. ועל חטא שחטאנו לבניך בצרות עין. For the sins we have committed against you by narrow mindedness. ועל חטא שחטאנו לבניך בגילוי עריות. For the sins we have committed against you through sex and love. על החטא שחטאנו לבניך במידוי פה. For the sins we have committed against you through empty confession. For all these sins, O God of mercy, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. Hear our voice, Adonai, our God. Be kind, sympathize with us. Willingly and lovingly accept our prayer. Turn, Turn us, us toward, toward you, Adonai, Adonai and, we and we will, will return, return to you. Make, Make our, our days, days seem fresh as they, they once were. were. Do not cast us away from you. Do not take your holy presence from us. Do not, Do not cast us away, away as we grow old. old. Do, Do not, not desert, desert us as our life ends. ends. Do not abandon us, Adonai, our God. Do not distance yourself from us. Give us hope. Be, Be our, our help, help and comfort. comfort. Hear our words, Adonai, and consider our innermost thoughts. May the, May words, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, Adonai, my rock and my redeemer. Shema. Mekabel berach 
silence.
We continue together on page 103. The accident of mortality makes life an interim of expulsion as quickened dust and ashes bookended by eternities. We were thrust at birth onto a stage as actors, unprepared for roles we never sought to have. With every day's performance, we edge closer to the final bow. But we Jews are well practiced in the art of exile, how to be at peace wherever we may be. Secured by goodness, love and learning, gratitude and dignity, empathy for suffering, integrity and kindness. These are the bricks and mortar of authentic Jewish coming home. So return, return to these, Kal Nidre charges, before lights go out and stage is darkened. Tonight, the world of things, events, and expectations retreats from consciousness that we may honestly confront what we have been, where we have gone, what we are worth, and if we have failed. We pray that at this time tomorrow night, when Ark doors open for Ni'ila, our final service of these days of awe, we may reclaim the promise we once knew we had. Tonight, at home with God and with one another, we pause for clarity of purpose en route to that rebirth. We will invite our Torahs to come back home to their ark, and we ask you all to please rise. Oh, 
Thank you. 
be seated. The brand new rabbi was at a loss. Every Shabbat, when the congregation got to the Shema, a fight erupted. Half the congregation was standing and half of them would be seated. Stand up, yelled the standers. Don't you know this is the most important prayer? Sit down, yelled the sitters. Don't you know Jewish law? One day, the new rabbi learned that there was a founding member of the congregation who was still alive. So he brought a representative from each faction to the home of the 103-year-old man. Surely he would be able to help settle the dispute. One side asked the old man, isn't it the tradition to stand for the Shema? No. That is not the tradition, he said. Aha, said one of the sitters. So we must all be seated for the Shema. No, that is not the tradition. Please, cried the young new rabbi to the old man. Just tell us what to do. Because right now, my congregation just fights all the time. One of them debating with the other whether they should sit or stand. Exactly, interrupted the old man. <laughs> that is the tradition. <laughs> now, this is an old Jewish joke. But if you've ever served on a synagogue ritual committee, right, Peter, am I right? You know how true it is. This is why he got rid of committees. Now, Jews are famously opinionated, argumentative, stiff-necked. It's a cultural disposition that goes back millennia. Now, after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, when we could no longer commune with God by animal sacrifice, we found a new pathway through rigorous debate. Modern Judaism as we know it was created in a crowded, noisy Beit Midrash where study became a divine calling. Never a solitary project, Jews learn in pairs called Hevruta. And the most legendary Hevruta of the entire Talmudic period was between the learned Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was head of the academy, and Reish Lakish, who was once a bandit, had no formal education, but was insatiably curious and street smart. I want you to imagine Albert Einstein sitting down to study with Al Capone. They were an odd couple, but they were perfectly matched sparring partners because Reish Lakish was unafraid to challenge Yochanan and they always argued respectfully, except for one time. When Yochanan called up Lakish's sordid past as an outlaw, Lakish was so upset, he took gravely ill and died. Yochanan was inconsolable. So his community brought him a brilliant new Hevruta. It seemed like a perfect match. Every time that Rabbi Yochanan would argue a point, his Hevruta would find a text to agree with him. It only took a few days before Rabbi Yochanan was exasperated. I don't need you to tell me I'm right. I already think I'm right, he complained. When I used to argue a point, Reish Lakish would counter it with 24 over other arguments. And now we would eventually get to where the, the idea became clear to both of us. Where are you, Reish Lakish? 
he cried in anguish. But of course, Raish Lakish was gone. The Talmudic story ends when Rabbi Yochanan loses his mind and he too dies. You've got to love rabbinic legend. Now, when I heard that story, I finally understood the famous expression, two Jews, three opinions. That saying always perplexed me. If the joke is supposed to remind us that Jews always disagree, it would suffice to say, two Jews, two opinions. Where does that third opinion come from? The story of Yochanan and Reish Lakish's Hevruta teaches us they would each argue their points until the matter became clear to both of them. In other words, they came to a third opinion. Only by listening to opposing views could they arrive at a conclusion that transcended either of their original positions. Now, we sometimes lament two Jews, three opinions hurts us in the Jewish community, divides us. But it is most certainly a feature, not a bug. It is, in fact, an intentional way that rabbinic Judaism defined itself against early Christianity. In 325 CE, a council of Christian bishops codified a doctrine called the Nicene Creed. It established uniform beliefs and practices mandated across the Christian world. Now contrast that to our code of Jewish law called the Talmud, also codified in the fourth century, which decidedly did not establish uniform practices or beliefs. Instead, the Talmud reads like a transcript of greatest rabbinic arguments. On legal matters, it deliberately includes the minority position as well as the majority, and it often answers a question with another. Over time, the inquiries and the commentaries of the great rabbinic thinkers would be written in the margins so that when you study a page of Talmud today, you can even argue Jewish law with rabbis across the centuries. The Talmud doesn't give us a creed to believe. It gives us a process for how Jews should debate and refine and finally come to our own beliefs. The struggle for knowledge itself is holy. Now I know that engaging with those who challenge or oppose us is not easy. We fight it with every fiber of our beings, which is why the Talmud warns us what can happen if we are not willing to engage. In another story about Reish Lakish, two rabbis are headed to the town of Asiya in order to set the lunar calendar with the right leap months. Reish Lakish asks if he can help them. And so the three rabbis set off together. <clears throat> Along the way, Reish Lakish questions several things that the two rabbis permitted. As they walked, his inquiries persisted and persisted. The rabbis grew so frustrated with him that when they arrived at Asiya, they climbed to the roof of the building, pulled up the ladder behind them, and set the calendar without him. Now, I get why they did it. When someone challenges us over and over, it's hard not to feel bothered and annoyed, maybe even threatened. It can feel good to climb up to some high place with our allies and pull up the ladder to avoid engaging with anyone who disagrees with us. But where does that leave us? Comfortable and happy? Maybe. But also stranded and isolated. 
those two rabbis on the roof, they never appear in the Talmud again. They disappear. They become irrelevant. Whereas Rach Lakish goes on to become the Steve Jobs of Jewish learning. <laughs> Rabbi Yochanan and Rach Lakish were willing to sit in the discomfort of their dissent and even doubt because they knew that their debates were in service of something much greater than themselves. Now, I know all of this is much easier to preach than it is to practice in real life. And I experienced some of this discomfort myself recently. Last May, I traveled to Israel on a UJA mission of New York rabbis right after the ceasefire. Israeli Jews described to us their terror of having to rush their families into bomb shelters in the middle of the night. Palestinians and Jews who had worked for years to create a shared society saw their fragile trust shattered overnight. I felt like I was there to sit shiva with the country. In the midst of all of this, a letter signed by 90 American rabbinical students made front page news in Israel. They signed from conservative, reconstructionist, pluralistic, and yes, reform seminaries. I understood why they were upset. I too feel frustrated by the continued occupation and its costs. But I was struck by how the letter accused Israel of violent suppression of human rights and, quote, enabling apartheid. I was also struck by what the letter didn't say. It was silent on the terrorist leadership of Hamas and its 4,000 rockets. It was devoid of any historical context, and there was not one expression of compassion or empathy for Israeli Jews. I was angry and embarrassed that in this moment, these students would choose to send this message. Before I filed the letter away, and I'm not proud of this, I thought to myself, I would not want to hire anyone who signed that letter. But I also knew that dismissing these students was not the answer. It wasn't very rabbinic on my part, and it wasn't very Jewish. I was pulling up the ladder on a large swath of future Jewish leaders. And I'm not just talking about those rabbinical students, but our own kids too. So many of you have told me that it's become impossible for you recently to have a conversation with your children or your grandchildren about Israel. But the answer is not to shut the next generation down, but to engage with them more deeply, to listen to them and push back and wrestle until the matter becomes clearer to everyone. The future of our Jewish community depends on it. And I dare say, the future of our democracy will depend on our ability to do this as well. I cannot think of a more important time in our country to promote the Jewish value of vigorous, respectful disagreement than right now. Our world has become frighteningly polarized. You're either with me or against me, on the left or on the right, Democrat or Republican, MSNBC or Fox News. But we know there should always be more than just two opinions. These positions are not just what we think. They've actually become our identities. In a recent Pew report, they found that it was significantly more important to Jews that their future grandchildren share their political convictions than marry someone Jewish. Think about that. In identity politics, 
whether you identify as a person of color or a socialist or a conservative or a Zionist, these communities often mandate that you take on a whole platform of beliefs wholesale. The price of belonging is towing the line. But let's remember what our tradition teaches, not what to believe, but how we get to beliefs worth holding. Questioning is sacred. Dissent is productive. If you start to debate, you may discover something that transcends the binary. You may discover a third opinion, and it will inevitably be wiser than either of the first two. On this Day of Atonement, in our restless return to our best selves, consider committing to this core Jewish practice. Seek out a Hevruta in your life. Not just the friend who tells you that you're right, but a real sparring partner like Lakish, where the goal of your interrogation is not winning the battle, but elevating your understanding. Where the baseline is decency and giving someone the benefit of the doubt. This year, instead of turning away from those difficult conversations, could we with humility speak to that friend who is not comfortable getting vaccinated? Ask your colleague why she opposes the right to an abortion? Inquire why your neighbor supports defunding the police. Ask your fellow congregant why he supports a one-state solution. Having these conversations will make our democracy better. It will make our country better. And it will make each of us better. We saw that with the greatest minds in the rabbinic era, with Yochanan and Reish Lakish. And we also saw it 2,000 years later with two of the greatest legal minds of our era, Justice Antonin Scalia and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This Saturday, we will be marking the one-year yard site of Justice Ginsburg. I remember so vividly hearing the news of her death right after Erev Rosh Hashanah services last year. Scalia and Ginsburg had great affection for each other. They were both native New Yorkers, best opera buddies, and New Year's Eve revelers for 30 years with their families. But they also disagreed on virtually every substantive issue, from same-sex marriage to abortion to the Voting Rights Act. Scalia famously said of Ginsburg, what's not to like? except her views on the law. <laughs> In the landmark Virginia Military Institute case, which allowed women to attend this historically male institution, Ginsburg authored a capstone opinion in her long career devoted to gender equality. There was only one dissenter, Scalia. Now, when Scalia died in 2016, Justice Ginsburg deeply mourned the loss of her great Hevruta. At his memorial, she recalled their vehement disagreement on the VMI case, but she praised how he disagreed. Scalia had given her a preview of his draft dissent, full of barbs, and disdainful footnotes. Ginsburg said, he absolutely ruined my weekend, but my opinion was ever so much better because of his stinging dissent. They might not have changed each other's thinking, but they made each other think better. Judaism does not promote blind faith or uniform beliefs. 
Struggling for truth is a way of engaging with God. That is literally what our name means, Yisrael, one who struggles with the divine. So let us all be seekers of wisdom and understanding, modeling a different kind of discourse, one that our ancestors took as a sacred pursuit, one that they knew was a path to authentic belief. Oh, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable before you, my God, my rock and my Redeemer. Oh, say shalom bim romah. Oh, yeah, say shalom. We turn now to Avinu Malkenu found on page 106. Please rise. Please join with me. Avinu Malkenu, hear our voice. Avinu Malkenu, we have sinned against you. Avinu Malkenu, have compassion on us and on our children. Avinu Malkenu, make an end to sickness, war, and famine. Avinu Malkenu, make an end to all oppression. Avinu Malkenu, inscribe us for blessing in the book of life. Avinu Malkenu, let the new year be a good year for us. Avinu Malkenu, be gracious and answer us, for we have little merit. Treat us generously and with kindness, and be our help. Avinu Malkeinu Shema Koleinu Avinu Malkeinu Chatanu Lefanecha Avinu Malkeinu
לשבח לאדון הכל, לתת גדולה ליוצר בראשית, שלא עשנו כגויי הארצות, ולא שמנו כמשפחות האדמה, שלא שם חלקנו כהם, וגורלנו ככל המונם. ואנחנו קוראים ומשתחווים ומודים לפני מלך מלכי המלכים הקדוש ברוך הוא Please be seated. I hope that you were able to have met our new president, Dr. Shani Silverberg, on Rosh Hashanah when she greeted our congregation. She is a brilliant doctor and a truly extraordinary human being. I could not be more fortunate that she has chosen to serve our congregation as our president, our leader. And I want to invite her up. She's already here to share a few words. I'm sorry. They're trying to train me. It's, it's difficult. I don't take direction very well. And I'm very short, in case any of you didn't notice. So they're trying to get me so that people can hear me. Anyway, it is wonderful to see all of you here. And it is wonderful to not see, but to know that all of you are there. Um, I happen to know that um, the website didn't crash tonight, but there are a lot of people live streaming. There is nothing in my background that suggests that I would ever serve as synagogue president, never mind as president of one of the largest congregations in what we Canadians fondly called the States. Growing up in Montreal in the mid-50s and 60s, I attended a Zionist Socialist Day School where we learned English and French subjects in the morning and Yiddish and Hebrew in the afternoon. We read the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, as a quasi-historical document. I was one of only two kids in my class whose parents didn't have a number tattooed on their arm, and we never attended synagogue. My Jewishness was everywhere around me, in our family, in school, in camp, in our pride in the new nation of Israel. Synagogues just wasn't important. I didn't need a Jewish home, at least not one outside of my parents' house and that of our insular Montreal Jewish community. Fast forward, in New York, the Jewish community was more synagogue-based. My husband and I were a Jewishly rootless young family with two kids, and we felt that it was important to affiliate. We, while we were synagogue shopping, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, then senior rabbi of Westchester Reform Temple, asked us if we would mind hosting a new rabbinic and cantorial intern in our home for the year. He promised that she would not be any trouble and that he would, she would teach our children, Zach and Nathaniel, in exchange. And then he introduced us to Angela Buchdahl. No trouble indeed. <laughs> so like many of you, I found my Jewish home here at Central. To me at least, one of the greatest things about Central is that people love it for so many different reasons. Some of us are here because of our long family association with the synagogue. We grew up here, we have wonderful and precious memories for generations from Central. Others never belonged to a synagogue before. Some came for the music, especially you guys up in the balcony. Others for the clergy, and still others for programs that educate our members and live streamers from the ages of 2 to 92. 
Some joined because our community welcomed them when others did not. And this year, more than any other, many of you out there think of Central as your Jewish home, despite the fact that you may never have stepped foot in our sanctuary and may instead be in San Diego, Los Angeles, Nashville, or Martha's Vineyard, to mention four cities where my relatives live streamed Rosh Hashanah, or in one of 87 countries around the globe where our services are available online. Regardless of how you came to Central or why you love it, this institution depends on your support. Last year at this time, we were six months into a pandemic that we all hoped would be in our rearview mirror by the time we got together to atone in 2021. And while we are clearly in a better place, we are definitely not done yet. We have been so ably led through this crisis by Angela, um, Rabbi Buckdahl, our spiritual leader, and by the indomitable Marsha Kaban and her staff who keep the synagogue functioning and excellent in every way. As John May, who is I think over there, one of our beloved officers described Central in the pandemic, while we were apart, Central brought us together. Central's clergy and staff worked tirelessly to shapeshift and innovate, creating new worship experiences and new versions of old worship experiences and old programs to keep us in touch. These innovations were only possible because we already had the infrastructure and then were able to provide the resources to support them. We are so grateful to you, our members, and our live stream donors who stepped up to support us last year. Unfortunately, as the pandemic crisis actually improves, we're seeing increased rather than decreased needs and costs for Central. When we found out that David Geffen Hall would not be available to us this year and would actually be downsized with the renovation, we committed to Radio City to provide an option for in-person worship. And two weeks later, the Delta variant hit. But I am pleased to report that I've just come from Radio City and we had a nice crowd of about 500 people, it, not a Radio City capacity crowd, but it, it was an, a lovely crowd of worship, worshipers at Radio City. And as disappointing as it is that more could not worship in, in person, we couldn't imagine not offering our congregants an option and an opportunity to get to, to come together for worship if public health conditions permitted. We have also have increased costs with what I'm calling the dual option. We're not in a COVID lockdown, thankfully, um, where everything is only online, but everything isn't all normal either. So instead, we are investing significantly this year in making both in-person and online options the best they can be. So we are investing, we are making sure that you all here in the sanctuary have a wonderful experience but we are also investing in a high production value for our online, which the community that comes to us by live stream has come to expect. Similarly, we're offering Hebrew school online and in person for all 600 of our students because we believe it is essential to engage and educate the next generation, even at an increased cost. And the same dual options will exist for our adult programming as well. Finally, with the sad but clear increase in anti-Semitism in our country and in our city, as a highly visible congregation, we need to and we are investing more in our security. So, this year, we hope all of you will again step up. We need all of you to again step up. Central has been there for us, and Central will be there for us. I ask you, think about your Central moment, a time this year when Central has been there for you. Was it when you woke up one day and realized that you actually had a meditation practice, even though you had always sworn that meditation was just not for you? Or when your grandchild called to tell you that one-on-one -on -one Hebrew lessons with their Central Hebrew teacher 
was the best school ever. Or when your child's bat mitzvah was more meaningful than you would ever imagine despite, despite strict COVID restrictions. Or, as is the case for many of our members and our live streamers, when you are able to say Kaddish for a loved one as part of a community. I'll share my central moments. First, listening to my 90-plus-year-old father belting out the Eleno from the recliner in his Berkshire's home, singing along with our clergy. Second, weeping as Angela sang Lechidlach under the chupa at my son Zachary and his bride Sky's wedding, 30 people on the front lawn instead of the 300 we had planned. And finally, hearing the Yiddish partisan song at my dad's recent funeral. Central has been there for me and my family, and Central will be there for you. We need you to support Central so Central can support you if, when, and how you need it to. If I have learned anything as a physician during this pandemic, it is that we must anticipate the unexpected. Central has shown itself to be nimble in response to the events of the last 18 months, and I am sure that more nimbleness will be required of us. I feel certain that we are up to the task. I look forward to working with each and every one of you to support Rabbi Bookdahl and our wonderful clergy and staff as we move from strength to strength. I wish each of you and your families a year of health and peace. Thank you very much. So now you know that my relationship with Shawnee began when I was a 22-year-old squatter in her house. <laughs> We've come a long way together. Just a few announcements that tomorrow we will be back here at 10 a.m. And also for all of our live streamers, services are at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And we would invite you, if you'd like, to stay with us all day long. Yes, we have not only a morning service and an afternoon service, but across the street in our community house, we will have a one o'clock uh, quiet meditation with beautiful music, and we will have a study session with Rabbi Rick Jacobs at 2.30. And at all times, there will be our project of sharing our stories, which is an archive project of capturing the incredible stories of people in our community. So we hope you'll take a few moments or stay all day and then stay on for our afternoon service um, for tomorrow. I just wanna say that it is really amazing to be back here with you. I had to hold myself back from crying when I walked down the aisle and saw all of your faces and saw you up close. It really is so moving to be back with you all. And um, it was hard not to smile through the whole service. If I have to say, I just have to say one thing in a really beautiful service, which is if you ever want to know proof for the existence of God, I will give you Exhibit A, Cantor Dan Mutlu's voice. Really, it is an otherworldly voice, and he can do things that you're, you shouldn't be able to do with your voice. And it's and he's superhuman. And really, you lifted all, all of our voices up today. It was incredible. And... Um, and really wonderful to sit, sit with you, Peter, always in this house that you built. So we are now going to um, turn to our moment of memory. Before that, a reading found on page 108. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness and often back again, from health to sickness and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, 
from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. Zichronam Rivlacha, may the memory of our loved ones be an abiding blessing. We rise together now for Kadish Yatom. Yit Kadal, Viet Kadash, Shemei Rabbah, Vialma, Divrach, Hirute, Viam Lich, Malchute, Bachai Hon, Viom Echon, Vachaye, the whole Beit Israel, Baagala, Uvisman Kari, Vim Ru, Amen. Yehesh me rabam of a rach le olam ul al me al maya. Yit barach vi ishtabach vi it paar vi it romam vi it nase. Vi it hadar vi it ale vi it halal shame de kudisham brihu. Leela ulu leela min kol bir hatava shirata. Tush bhatava nechamata. Da amiran di alma vim ru amen. Yehesh lama rabam min shemaya. Bahayim alenu vel kol Yisrael vim ru amen. O se shalom bim romav. Hu ya se shalom alenu vel kol Yisrael vel kol yoshve tevel vim ru amen. up to join us and Shani for our closing song together. Page 110. I know this last verse is one of Peter's favorites. Biadoaf kidruchi. My hand, I have entrusted my spirit in your hand. God is with me. I will not be afraid. Adon olam b'ashem alach b'terem ko yitzir nivra le'et nasa b'chev soko azay melech shemo nivra
Tov. Good Yantif.